Uh, welcome to the Thomas B. Fordham Institute on uh, Monday morning of the week before Christmas. Thanks for joining us. It's a little gloomy outside, but it is bright and cheerful inside. Um, and we are here to determine whether the topic at hand is gloomy or bright and cheerful. Um, and uh, the topic at hand is whether uh, troubled schools can be turned around at all and, with, and or with the infusion of federal dollars uh, under a federal program. And uh, uh, we're going to commence uh, with Carmel Martin, uh, Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Education who is going to take not more than 10 minutes to explain the um, uh, findings of the uh, recent uh, one-year uh, evaluation review of the SIG program uh, and put the program into some broader context with regard to the school turnarounds. Uh, she will be followed by uh, uh, Andy Smerick, who is affiliated with Fordham and also with uh, Bellwether and was the Deputy Commissioner of Education in New Jersey till recently and the author of a new book, um, and he's going to uh, uh, explain why he thinks uh, uh, schools can't be turned around by districts, uh, at least districts as we know them. Uh, and then uh, from the actual trenches, uh, uh, the real world will be represented by Jean-Claude Brizard, uh, who has uh, run the schools of Chicago and Rochester and also has a track record in New York City. Um, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what he's going to say, but uh, it will represent reality. Uh, and uh, uh, though, 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 in fairness, uh, Carmel and Andy have had their doses of reality too in this uh, uh, in this really very complicated world. I uh, also, uh, uh, Andy will show you a copy of his new book. Um, you can go buy one online, uh, and he'll be thrilled, and his publisher even more so. Uh, and I will um, also mention that um, uh, sitting out on the uh, table uh, that everybody skipped over is a three-year-old Fordham study called "Our Bad Schools Immortal," uh, and uh, uh, which found in 2010 that uh, most bad schools seem to stay that way over time. Uh, that, was the, that was the findings of our research on this topic. Uh, there's more biographical information on the, uh, uh, on the handout, uh, so I'm not going to spend time uh, introducing the speakers. Uh, Fordham Institute, as you likely know, is uh, an education reform and policy think tank in D.C., uh, and on the ground in Ohio. And I'm Chucker Finn, and I, at the moment, am president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Carmel Martin, thanks for being here. Thank you. And you may stand here or stay there, whichever you prefer. I'll stay. Or an ad, sure. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I want to start by thanking Chucker and Fordham for putting this together. This is, there's um, no more critical topic for us to be talking about in education do you want to stop to say that it is a fairly gloomy day and will be a gloomy week because of the tragic events in um, Connecticut on Friday? So that is something that we at the department will be spending a lot of time um, thinking about and working on this week, making sure that we're providing all the supports we can for those on the ground in Connecticut. So as the mother of two small children, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that reason for gloom um, and sadness. Um, but with respect to the topic at hand, turning around low-performing schools, I would describe our approach and, and sense of this at the moment as one of um, optimism, although um, pragmatic um, realism that there, there's a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I, I first want to, before I get into my presentation, just correct, checker if I may, there is no one-year evaluation, there are no findings. I think we have been very, very clear in our language around this. I think others, including Andy, have, um, have projected that we have, uh, have described this data in a way that we have not described it. It is the first year data from our program, the SIG program. We think it was important to have transparency around that data. We draw a sense of optimism from that data, and I'll describe why in a few moments, but I just want to be very clear. We are not pretending that this is um, a rigorous evaluation. We are working on a rigorous evaluation, and we will have results from that, and we'll look to learn from that. In the meantime, we're looking at this data as a leading indicator, something that we're trying to make, to look at, have a check on how things are going, um, to assist us in making modifications where that's possible or necessary. Um, there's a few things that I want to cover, and I'll try to keep to the 10-minute time frame. Uh, the first is to talk a little bit about the genesis for the SIG program which is the School Improvement Grant Program, um, a summary of the data that we recently released, 
and um, then talk a little bit about the evidence we have to date, which includes that data, but includes a lot of other information that supports our contention that there is reason for optimism that um, districts, charter management organizations, um, educators can turn uh, failing schools around. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit, uh, give a little rebuttal to the critics' assertion that the program is a failure, although um, in the interest of time, may wait and uh, let Andy make his case and I can respond to that. I guess first, in terms of the genesis of the, the program, this is an issue that obviously, if you know anything about Arne Duncan, has been near and dear to his heart as long as he's been involved in um, education reform. His first uh, foray into this area is to follow the model that Andy describes, which is to open a charter um, a charter school that to, that would help low performing and disadvantaged children. As uh, superintendent, he embraced the idea that charters had an important role to to play in terms of helping to turn around failing schools. But he also um, spent a lot of time um, with the traditional school model in that context. Um, when he got to Washington, he knew of the, the data that was in the Fordham report. It, it's post our arrival in Washington. But if you look at the, the Fordham paper that Checker describes, as well as a 2009 study by Tom Loveless, you could, there, there is indeed a historical trend of the lowest performing schools not getting better. That is something that the secretary was very conscious of, the president was very conscious of. But to describe either of those two bodies of research as a, um, an analysis of turnaround efforts, I think, is is wrong. I think that um, it, it documented the performance of those schools, but it's not based on a national, robust effort to turn them around. But rather, um, documents what we we found, what we believe to be true when we came to Washington, which is that with respect to most of these schools, all that had happened for de decades was essentially tinkering at the edge, edges. We also saw this hat playing out through the No Child Left Behind law. That law, which authorized the funding for SIG, although it, um, there was never substantial funding in the program before the Obama administration, but that, that program did um, lay out an accountability scheme that contemplated that the lowest performing schools would be tackled. It was called restructuring under that framework. But what we saw when we got, um, when we reviewed the progress made under No Child Left Behind is that 90% of the schools um, chose something that was in the statute, which I have to take some responsibility for since I worked on the, on the development of the law, which was to choose the option of other rather than the other options, which really were to aggressively tackle the governance structure of these schools. Um, so um, essentially, we also found a narrative of hopelessness, a sense that people felt that there was just no nothing that could be done in these schools. Uh, Secretary Duncan said at that time, for far too long, adults, educators, and leaders have passively observed educational failure with a complacency that is deeply disturbing. So in, um, in seizing the opportunity that he was provided through the Recovery Act with, for the first time, billions of dollars to leverage against these low, lowest performing schools, we essentially had three objectives. One was to change the narrative of pessimism and complacency with respect to these schools. The second was to change, and most importantly, to change on the ground what was happening in our lowest performing schools that there were, so that there were dramatic changes for kids. And the third was to start a national, a national, not a federal, but a national movement around school turnaround. Um, through SIG, we're investing far more resources in these schools and requiring far more r rigorous action than ever before. So whether you consider SIG a promising program or not, to date, um, it is a program instead of in interventions at scale that are without precedent. Unlike Andy, we're optimistic about what we're seeing. Um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about the data. Uh, what the data, the initial data tells us is that 25% of SIG awarded schools replaced at least half of their staff, converted to charter schools, or closed down. There's a very, very small number that, that chose uh, to convert to charter schools or close down, um, but there, there are a good number of these schools that have effectively sh shut down and, and restarted under one of our options with new staff. The other 75% replaced their leadership, increased learning time, implemented job-embedded professional development and other critical reforms. 
45% of the schools were high schools, which is an overrepresentation of high schools. This is a really important point because historically, under uh, NCLB, very, very few high schools were uh, attempted to be restructured um, because of the, the funding uh, mechanisms under Title I. Um, the other um, significant um, factor in terms of the, the makeup of these schools is that we have an overrepresentation of rural schools in the program, which is really important because um, many people argue that uh, turnaround could not be done in rural schools. In terms of results, uh, two-thirds of the schools showed gains in meet, reading and math. Elementary schools did a little bit better at 70% showing gains. Rural schools, again, the schools that folks claim could not be uh, tackled in this context have some of the greatest gains. And a, th and a third of the schools did have declines in achievement. Not sh shocking, um, given that these were the lowest performing schools in the states in which they, they reside. Um, I, I guess I'd just like to say, first of all, that we, we believe strongly that you shouldn't overread too much into one year of data, either to validate victory or to uh, declare defeat. The Secretary said when we released the data, none of these schools are where they need to be or will be yet, and we're only talking about the first year of data, where everyone recognized we need several years of data to confirm a lasting improvement in academic achievement. But based on our monitoring, our look at the data, and our visits <clears throat> to many of these schools, we do think that there, it, there is a pattern that we can dis discern, which we'd actually like to validate to, through our evaluation activities. And that pattern is that talent matters. Um, this, among the schools that are moving in the right direction, they all have two things in common. They all have a dynamic principal with a clear vision for establishing a culture of clear high expectations. And they all have talented teachers who share that vision with a relentless commitment to improving instruction supported by job embedded professional development. Um, we, we, do have a rigorous study in, in process through IES. The one study that has been done of the SIG program in the SIG schools in California confirm our sense of optimism, don't prove that this program is a success, but do confirm a sense of optimism. Thomas D. study showed that SIG awarded schools had significantly greater gains in student achievement compared to similar non-SIG schools. We also have anecdotal evidence um, when you get outside the, the, uh, the beltway, we think it's um, hard to deny that low-performing schools are not immortal because we're seeing a cultural shift in many of these schools. For the first time, there's a palpable sense of possibility. Um, as an example, I would point to Emerson Elementary School in Kansas City, Kansas, which um, almost all minority, all uh, low income, 48% English learners. They went from 47% in math proficiency to 86% in, in math proficiency and similar gains in reading. Um, I can give you dozens of examples like that school uh, that show that this can be done, it is being done. But I think the, the other the piece that, I'll try to be brief because I know my time is almost up, but I think the other evidence that we bring to bear when we think about this topic is we look at the national movement that has been created largely by this program. Um, and it is really exciting when you look at the partnerships between business and nonprofit organizations rallying around the schools. There's a turnaround arts initiative that's helping schools like Orchard Gardens in Roxbury, Massachusetts in their turnaround efforts. We're, we have a partnership with the Corporation for National Service to help get core members, their AmeriCorps members, into these uh, turnaround schools. Through the FLEX initiative, we are seeing statewide systemic efforts towards turnaround for the first time in our history. States like Tennessee, Michigan, and Oklahoma are creating turnaround districts modeled after Louisiana's recovery school district. Connecticut and Delaware have created net networks of their lowest performing schools. The Massachusetts Democratic governor sought new power um, to tackle his lowest performing schools despite opposition from key stakeholder groups in his state. We see people being recruited nationally to run turnaround efforts in states. I'm trying to recruit people at the Department of Ed who I'm losing out to states and districts as they hire people because they're looking for the best and the brightest to do these efforts in their districts and in their states. We see school districts like Houston and Denver that are borrowing from the highest performing CMOs. <clears throat> 
who, to their credit, have been trailblazers in this space to tackle schools through dramatic changes. Initial results by Roland, uh, studied by Roland Fryer show that their efforts are working. They're getting as good, if not better, results than the Harlem Children's Zone and, KIPP, and the KIPP charter schools. So all of these are, are reasons for optimism. Um, so therefore, it won't be surprising that I, I reject Andy's condemnation of the program. And I can talk about why I think, uh, since Checker's here, his, his uh, writings define failure up for SIG while defining failure down for other schools. That's a Patrick Moynihan um, uh, construct that maybe only Checker and I can get at the moment. But in, in, in rebuttal uh, to, to uh, Andy's presentation, I can describe it a little bit further. I just want to close by saying we, we agree with Andy that there is tremendous um, opportunity provided by high-performing charter schools. This administration has clearly shown support for charter schools. We've um, increased the budget for our charter, particularly our high-performing charter management organization competition. Uh, we use the power of race to the top to incent states to eliminate obstacles to charters. Our SIG policy includes as one of its options takeover by a high-performing CMO. But what we reject is that it is a, a silver bullet to school turnaround or frankly a silver bullet to school reform. It's not a practical proposal to say that we should abandon our public schools and instead just seed uh, growth of, of, char uh, of charters. I would also say that we have to have humility in looking at the success of charters. Some of the high performing charters are trailblazers. They are schools that we should seek to replicate both in a public and charter context. But if you look at data and on charter schools, including the uh, Credo study, which Andy claims was a grand slam for charters, it doesn't look tremendously different than the same type of uh, data we're seeing coming out of some of the district turnaround efforts. It's also not practical. In rural districts, it's not really an option. Um, so I say all that not to say that we, sh we don't agree that we should um, use charters as an option in this space when we can and that we should learn from high-performing charters and replicate that. That is, that is exactly what they're doing in Houston and Denver. We spent about two hours with the superintendents from Houston and Denver on Friday morning with Arnie, and um, it, it is just they have a, tr a really great story to tell. and. Um, again, gives us a great sense of op optimism when we're looking at what they're doing. We need to learn from what, what's happening and make, um, and make adjustments. But I just hope we don't continue this old narrative that, that this is an impossible task and we should give, it up, give up. It concerns me that we see extremes from the left and the right converging on this concept that uh, we have to give up on our public school system. Um, we, you know, when we entered into this debate, we did get a lot of pushback from the left that until we eradicated poverty, it was impossible to turn around these schools. Now we're getting um, pushback from the right that we should just give up on the public system and pivot to uh, growth of charters. Um, there's, there's some real hard things we need to do. We do need to tackle staffing rules that make it diff difficult for district leadership to bring in the best talent, and we have to tackle the impacts of poverty. But the folks with the most success are doing both, um, and I think their efforts are diminished by uh, policy wonks like me condemning them to failure based on one, one, one year of data. We owe them a commitment to use the data to, to make modifications. We owe them a commitment to learn from success and failure. But we, have, we, we think there is good reasons to have real hope and a sense of opportunity that educators can make a meaningful difference in low-performing schools. As uh, my boss said, we have to approach this work with a real humility coupled with a tremendous sense of urgency. We aren't declaring victory, but we will not accept defeat. Thank you. Thanks, Carmel. Uh, just one factual question. The, the, the national data are one year. The California study you mentioned, do you know offhand? Is that more than one year? It is, yeah. It is, okay. Uh, where would you like to be? I don't mind being here. I, okay. As long as yeah, the screens are up. And the screens are up with your, your yeah, slides. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, Andy Smarrick. Uh, 
so thank you. A great presentation. There's much in it uh, with which I disagree, and I hope we have a chance to get into that during question and answer. But there's one piece that I have to address up front, and it's this um, false dichotomy between um, this idea that to argue against turnarounds or to argue against the district is to argue against public education, and that is completely false. Um, a district, an urban district, is just one way of delivering public education. So you can be against failing traditional public schools, you can be against the district, and still be for public education. Charter schools are public schools. Okay, so with that, I just want to do four things in my presentation. The first is put SIG in context. Um, there is a long history of turnarounds. We are not the first people to try to fix low performing schools, and it goes back much further than you may believe. The second is talk about my New Jersey experience, what I learned on the ground about this implementation. Um, then go into a bit more detail about what we know about the SIG results and some uh, digging in that I did beyond what the department has provided, and then give a set of recommendations. Uh, I want to focus my attention on those last two things because I think they're most important. We can do Q&A with the other two if you'd like. So uh, the short story here is both in the turnaround fallacy, this article I wrote in 09, and in chapter four of this book, I do a long, long history. Let's hold up the book, Andy. Everybody gets to see that you have a new book out. Right? <laughs> its name is The Urban School System of the Future. School system, by the way. Yes. Uh, I. Um, uh, bad at publicizing this thing as my pub. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but the gist of this is since the mid 1960s, we have been going about the business of trying to make our low performing schools better. Don't believe that this is a new generational thing. We've had Title I, we've had gigantic philanthropic efforts, we've had state takeover of districts and schools, we've had restructuring under NCLB. We call them different things, but they are all of the exact same fabric, and they all lead to the exact same thing, disappointing results time and time again. And yet we have the same excuses by the turnaround crowd. On the front end, they say, this time it'll be different. And then when things don't work out, they say, give us more time, give us more money. Change is happening. Results will happen soon. Um, and this is just a broken record that happens for 50 years. Um, and that's how I think we have to begin thinking about SIG. It is in that context. So that's why I'm skeptical. So just to uh, give you actually the data that Carmel and Checker referred to, um, Tom Loveless looked at uh, the bottom 25% of schools in California over uh, 20 years and said, how many of those lowest performers can make it into the top quartile after 20 years? 1.4%. They weren't left alone. They underwent year after year after year of turnaround options. Didn't work. Um, Stewart for the Fordham Foundation looked at the bottom 25% and asked how many of them can even make it to the top half. 1% made it to the top half. And this is not just California. This is multiple states over multiple years. Um, turnarounds don't work. OK, so my New Jersey experience. So. Uh, the, probably the biggest lesson I learned overall um, coming with SIG is how much the federal government tied our hands. And it's with this infamous I-4 provision of this federal guidance. Uh, the federal guidance documents tells the state, SEA, what they can actually do with the program. And I and the people who worked with me believed, okay, we actually have to make the districts take SIG seriously, not treat this as they've treated other things, just business as usual. So we wanted them to use the most aggressive reform options possible. And so the federal guidance actually asks a question. Can an SEA require an LEA to do one of the four um, options? The federal government says explicitly, no. Think about this. These are the most dysfunctional districts, the most dysfunctional schools, and we're saying that the state has no power over what um, option they pick. So guess what they're going to do? More on that in a second. Um, the other thing that I really learned about this is just uh, how dysfunctional and resistant districts can be when it comes to their lowest performing schools. When I tried to talk to them about the massive improvement that we expected under SIG, that this had to be different, they looked at me like I had three heads. They wanted to talk about much different things. And when we finally got to talk about achievement results, um, we just got the litany of excuses um, that you know so well. You know, our board is the problem. Um, our contracts are the problem. Where ought to I be put? <laughs> there. Um, you know, poverty is the problem. Uh, our neighborhoods are the problem. 
what it really struck me after a couple months at the State Department of Education is this simple statement. If we're depending on these district leaders to deliver the dramatic results the Secretary was talking about, we're probably barking up the wrong tree. And I think the results actually prove that. Uh, so we did two things in New Jersey to try to make this work out as best we could. So I was determined to see how much we could get out of SIG. And the first thing is we actually sent out a memo to all districts that were eligible for SIG 2 funding, the second round of it. And we said to them the following in this letter, previous efforts have not worked. You have got to be aggressive. Therefore, we're going to give a competitive preference to districts that send in uh, applications that do the boldest models, try to replace these programs. We had a little bit of success with this. It kind of changed the behavior in some of the applications, not as much as we wanted, but we gave it the old college try. The second thing we did is we actually told SIG districts, fine, you're getting all this money. We can't tell you what to do with it. But what we can do is tell you, as a result of getting this money, you have to do other things in your district. For example, make sure your curriculum is aligned with Common Core. Make sure you get better on teacher evaluations. Make sure you get better on formative assessments. That is district-wide, not just focused on SIG. The results of this, it was harder to determine. Um, a couple interesting stories with Newark I'm happy to go into, but this was another effort that we had at the state level to try to make things better. Okay. Oh, heavens. So SIG results. Um, the Center for Reinventing Public Education did this study where they tried to figure out, are districts and schools taking this seriously this time around? And they found out, um, in their own words, the overwhelming majority of schools studied so far exhibit li little evidence of the type of bold transformation envisioned by Secretary Arne Duncan. And this aligns with what I was seeing in the state. Um, and this was confirmed by quali quantitative data that was just released by IES. So are districts doing the biggest, boldest, baddest things to make sure massive change happens? So the weak rule of transformation is all the way to the left, and closure, the biggest, strongest one, is to the right. States can't tell them what to do. They've done the same thing for 50 years, and of course they pick the option that is the weakest. I guess it shouldn't be a surprise. So now to get into the data that Carmel was referring to and why we come to different conclusions on this. Um, Secretary Duncan started talking about the success of the SIG program. As a matter of fact, there's a blog post called School Turnarounds Are Working, belying this idea that they're not declaring success yet. Um, but then we had to wait eight months for any data at all, and what we got ultimately is just a couple graphs. So that started me scratching my head on this. What's going on there? Um, we still don't have school-level data. Why is that the case? Um, the conspicuous release date, which I have talked about, why release this on a Friday right before Thanksgiving if you are really that proud of it? This unusual casual language about single-digit, double-digit gains, I've never seen this before. Usually the department will talk about statistically significant results or talk about pre- and post-scores, and they didn't, which raised a red flag for me. Because it's not an evaluation. It would be inappropriate to talk about it in those that terminology, well, Andy. I, actually, I have a different interpretation that I'll show you. Um, so the, as you can see here, this is no small thing. More than a third of these schools got worse. And I've looked at as many turnaround studies as anywhere as anyone. I've never seen anything like this before. These are the lowest performing schools, and more than a third of them got worse. And as far as these great results, fewer than one-sixth made double-digit gains in reading. That means five-sixths didn't after millions and millions and millions of dollars. That says something. So I did some digging of my own, and I think this is um, instructive. So I said, what does this actually mean on the ground? And I know New Jersey school system data, so I dug up this data from 0910. These are all SIG schools in Camden. These are their school scores pre-SIG, heartbreaking. I mean, 10, 12, 15% proficiency pre-SIG. Now remember, we're talking about dramatic change under SIG. This is post-SIG. I mean, virtually no change at all. So if you're the department and you're trying to spin this as well as possible, how do you do so? You see the school at the far left and far right actually were the ones who made a little bit of progress. Well, you call 0.8% a single digit gain. You call 11.7 double digit. And you say the ones that went backwards didn't make much gain at all. And this is in the framework of what the department would look like. So just bear me with, with just one second here. Take a look at the school um, fourth from the right. Imagine that had done a little bit better. Instead of going backwards, it had made a little bit of an increase. Now we have two schools making single digit 
uh, improvements, one double, two going backward. And this is what it would look like in the department's framework. Almost identical to what the SIG national results are. The point that I'm trying to make to you is that Camden looks a whole lot like the SIG results. Is this what we're paying $5 billion for? 40% of schools that are bad getting worse. 40% of schools that are doing badly marginally getting better. And then a school going from very, very, very bad to very bad. Not very encouraging. That's why in the context of 50 years worth of turnarounds, I'm not so hopeful. So we actually have, where do we go from here? We have a history, we have a lesson here. We've misinvested billions of dollars, um, but we still care about kids assigned to low performing schools. So is there any lesson? Has this ever happened before misinvesting billions of dollars? Do we have some model to move forward? And the answer is yes. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So they, as you may remember, invested in turnarounds for about a decade, the Small Schools Initiative. And it didn't work. And so let me make sure I get the language here correct. And so after nine years in the 2009 annual letter that um, uh, the, the foundation put out, they said, we've given $2 billion to this initiative, give schools extra money, hope they get better, um, hope they would become more effective. But what we realized is that they did not improve student achievement in any significant way. A few of, of the schools that we funded, however, actually did something amazing. Almost all of these schools are charter schools. Here's the kicker. We had less success trying to change an existing school than helping to create a new one. Bill Gates and his foundation learned from the failure of turnarounds, even though they had spent $2 billion and they invested in what works, starting new schools, um, expanding and replicating high-performing ones. So my recommendation is we got to start plan being ASAP rather than losing $5 billion. And that means trying as much as we can to divert SIG funds into this new school strategy, which I hope is the department's um, strategy for the next four years. Close failing schools, open new schools with the DNA of success in the charter sector, replicate and expand high performers. And here's a roadmap for doing it. It's my self-publicity there. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Andy, thank you. John Claude, do you want to stay there? Or stand up. Oh, I'll stay here. Okay, go for it. But uh, from the now, from the real world. <laughs> Good morning. I think it's all it's all real. Um, let me just uh, preface by saying that um, I have tremendous respect respect for Arnie Duncan. He had my job for a bit longer than I had um, in Chicago. It's better imagining politics, I guess, in Chicago than I was. Um, and I think he gets it. Um, he he's done this work. Um, he has seen it on the ground. Uh, he understands the difficulties in the politics of, of how to do um, um, school turnaround. So tremendous respect um, and 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 um, grat gratification for the work he's doing right now at, um, in Washington. Let me start by by first talking a bit about my own personal experience as a principal um, about 12, 13 years ago, uh, as a principal of a school called George Westinghouse High School in Brooklyn, New York where I received, uh, some of you may remember the CSR, CSRD grants back about 12 years ago. Uh, they gave me $300,000 over three years um, to turn around a school that was uh, uh, bottom 2%, perhaps in the state of, of, of New York. Uh, 100000 a year uh, was, in lot, was not a lot of money, uh, was just enough to provide some professional development and to hire what they call in those days a model developer. And we had expeditionary learning at were bound. It was their first foray into urban education from Dubuque, Iowa. Um, and they've learned a lot uh, from us uh, as a school in Brooklyn, mostly boys, vocational high school. Um, and their model now is so much, much stronger, I think, because, because of it. It uh, wasn't much money, but what it did was force us to really look at the best use of time, people, and money. Look at how we're go going to use existing funds and existing structures uh, to, make, to make things happen. We had some gains, um, some good things happened in that school. Uh, unfortunately, it's still struggling to, um, today um, um, as a school in, in New York City, um, nearly a decade um, um, later. Um, one thing happened though, throughout the tr transformation or, or the restructuring, we had a change in leadership at our district. Uh, we had these sort of regional offices in New York City. And the second person that we had did not understand our work and became a huge impediment to what we had to do. And hopefully you'll see that thread um, sort of flow through my, 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 my presentation. Um, we 
basically found had to find ways to create a buffer between ourselves and this individual, this this leader. In fact, we actually went down to central office looking at this new charter thing that people were talking about to see how we can create our own organization to get away from one person. Not the, the staff of the district, but for one individual who basically became a huge issue for us uh, in the work we were trying to do. So let's take a look at perhaps uh, what Carmen was talking about, what Indy was talking about. Uh, and in some ways, over the last 10, 20 years, why this is such a mixed um, sort of um, 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 performance um, across across the country. Let's agree on a few fundamentals. First of all, that schools fail over time. No school turn around one day and just, just begins just just fails. It fails over time, and for a number a number um, um, of reasons, district capacities and policies. Um, I've seen um, large high schools in New York City and in Rochester, New York, have 50, 60 percent of their population being spe special education uh, kids who are struggling. Um, a partner on study that we did when I was head of high schools for New York found that size alone was not the cause of failure for schools, but concentration of very very needy kids in one place was a, a recipe for disaster. And when you combine the two, schools in New York City had a one in two chance of failing. So district policies or placement uh, policies or enrollment policies very often uh, create the kinds of failure situation you see in schools um, um, across across our country. In, in Rochester, my predecessor used it as a strategy. Concentrate ELLs, English language learners, in one school and flood the place with services, you're going to get results. And what happened, of course, is that the school tanked and failed. Um, and when you had a leader and teachers who were overwhelmed by that situation, they could not make it, make it, make it happen. Second, um, human capital issues, and I think Carmen um, uh, alluded to this, are huge impediments for, 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 su for success. And it's not just the school, but the school district and at times state policies. And I don't mean the state education. I don't mean the SEAs. I'm talking about the politicians at the state offices who have laws um, that provide for the kinds of lasting first out situations you've got across, across schools. Let me give you a very specific example. As a principal in my second year of this turnaround, I had a, an opening for a social studies teacher. Um, they sent me two from the district office. One was drunk, one was sober. Or one was drunk, one was incompetent. Um, and I was told I had to pick one. And I argued very loudly. I, I had a third candidate was better. I wanted somebody else. And I was told, no, you got to pick one of those people. So I picked a sober person. And about a year later, I was now locked into a termination process, what we call in New York a 3028 process, which lasted two years uh, to move this person out of, of, of my school. Um, over the course of my uh, nearly four years as principal, I worked in that school for 13 years, four years as principal, uh, I spent the better part of my time removing uh, assistant principals, removing um, uh, uh, teachers um, over a process that was quite arduous. And why most principals in schools tend to give up after a while because those processes tend to last longer than the principals um, in those schools. That's a big part um, of the problem. We, we do know it is easier to create exceptional new schools instead of fixing an existing school. It's a very difficult uh, uh, process. Um, in, in New York City, in Rochester, our work focused quite heavily on high schools um, of, both, of both, both, uh, both cities. In Rochester, when I walked in, the city had the lowest graduation rate in the state of New York. Um, sadly, two, two and a half years after I'm gone, it's right back down to, to last again in New York. We walked in, we began the process of transformation. SIG was a huge lever for us in pushing through, not just because of the money, frankly, but because of the, uh, of the capacity to push and, and perhaps the win behind ourselves, uh, the initiative put. Um, the new commissioner in New York, David Steiner and John King, were quite instrumental in pushing. They asked me when they came in uh, as, as deputy and as commissioner, what do you need? I said, order me to close schools. Some of my board members are terrific and will support this. Some are terrified and will not support this. If you give me this kind of push, you will help me get, make things happen. Long story short, we had a 7-0 vote to close half the high schools um, um, in the city. Um, changed quite a bit of staff and leaders in some cases. Uh, I didn't like initially the provision that the principal had to be replaced in the SIG if they were there more than two years because I had principals in those cases who were making tremendous progress but were impeded by the, 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 the politics of the district, the policies of the district, and, and perhaps some of the human capital issues that they had to, to, to face. I knew they could do it given the right kinds of support um, I mean, structure. So we, we focused on the high schools, made tremendous progress in those high schools, um, and, but it came at um, um, it, it, doing the process of changing or creating a new culture um, in those places. Um, too often we know that it's not 
just one group but mu multiple issues um, that create those kinds of those kinds of issues. So I'm just very quickly to end. Um, the federal government has little um, 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 capacity to push except for the dollars. And Arnie Duncan himself says that they provide 8% of the funding in, in public education in America and they are a minority investor. We do get that. But what I've seen lately in SIG has been sort of somewhat um, um, helpful in terms of giving SEAs um, some control over, over those processes. So let me just say some things I worry about. One, the, the two million per year for three years worries me because I see schools buying staff or buying people and I don't see long-term sustainability. Once the money goes away, what happens um, in those schools worries me um, quite a bit. You cannot remove the need to reform schools from the need to reform from districts. And this is where I think Andy and I are, uh, are more aligned. You've got to create a flat organization that gives principals your time and power to do what they have to do. I don't know if it's charter, or whatever is the solution. In, in, in Chicago, we had these contract schools called the Academy for Urban School Leadership who come in and they replace everybody. Same case, the kids don't move. Uh, and the culture change. But these folks know how to create schools. They know how to bring aligned people, district, union, teachers, with district principals in, in a construct that provides quite a bit of, uh, of autonomy to the schools and, and good things tend, um, tend to happen. We have an obsession in America over teacher uh, effectiveness without talking about principal effectiveness. The fact is that this protagonist, if you give that person the power to create a constellation of great teachers, you're going to get good things to happen. We don't have a strong bench when it comes to our principals across the country, it worries me. Too many folks are, are using the transformation model, which I think is the get out of jail free card. Um, but I'm watching to see that SEA is now getting much more belligerent about pushing for systemic change. But often they'll tell you you've got to do X, but within the context of a CBA, a contractual uh, agreement that often impedes what needs to happen without the capacity to implement really good teacher support systems or evaluation systems. So what I'm saying very simply is that uh, complex problems require comprehensive solutions. You can't just look at a school and say turn around. You've got to look at the entire system, the entire fabric and turn the entire thing around. Otherwise, you're not going to get what you're looking for. Last thing I'll say is that Westinghouse High School had all the goals of, of, current, of the current SIG. The issues that we had was that we were trying to reform ourselves in the context of a district that didn't understand, didn't get it, and with people who were putting barriers all along the way for us to be successful. To change the whole thing, you've got to, to change the school, you've got to change the entire fabric, not just one, uh, one institution. Thank you. I suspect you want to respond to a few things. Um, before that, I, I need to get one thing a little bit clear. Of these, of these four models of school change in the SIG uh, uh, program, pretty sure I heard Andy say that the state had no authority to um, specify one. And I think I just heard you say that states are getting more aggressive in determining which one uh, should be used. Um, can you cl clarify the policy here? Do state a SEAs have the authority to pick and choose and tell their districts which one to use, or does this have to be left to the district to select for the school? So like so many things in education in America, it mm -hmm. depends on the state. So it, there's a lot of variability among states, but what we do see from uh, many states in response to Race to the Top, to the SIG program, to our ESEA Flex Initiative, we see more and more SEAs, if they don't have the authority to do so, getting that authority from their state legislatures. Uh, Governor um, Patrick in Massachusetts is a perfect example of that. He did not have the authority, but he um, worked with stakeholders in his state to get himself that authority. I think um, Commissioner Cerf has also asserted a stronger role through our ESCA Flex Initiative. I think the, re the results in New Jersey actually um, are we have more updated data than um, what Andy presented, and it shows a continuing positive trend there. I, I think there's a lot of states that are actually getting even more radical in terms of what they're doing in terms of their lowest performing schools, again, in response to um, some of our policies. So, Andy, on this sort of narrow point, when you said that you didn't have the authority at the New Jersey Department of Education, 
to specify one of the four models. Was this a state limitation? Or I thought you implied that it was a federal limitation. No, I, I didn't imply. I showed you the actual federal language from a document that the U.S. Department of Education put out. I mean, it's very specific. We cannot tell them what to do. I think what Carmel's referring to is, and the, um, the guidance actually says this, if under state law the state has the right to own a school or own a district like the RSD or ASD, then because of that, then they can drive it. Um, but unless the state legislature actually gives you power over individual schools or individual districts. This is by federal rule within the power of the districts and schools. But isn't that saying that the federal government cannot give you a power that the that your own state didn't give you? Am I interpreting this? So correctly? are you saying that, yeah, I mean the state legislature could all of a sudden say, Chris Surf, you can do whatever you want with any school in any district at any okay. time. They are loath to do that. The legislature. Correct. Okay, so, but this is not, I, I just want to be clear, and there's plenty to blame the federal government for. I'm not uh, avoiding that. Uh, uh, but uh, this particular restriction doesn't appear to be a federal restriction. Well, no, I, I think I disagree because we have a, a clear system that's been going on since the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The federal government gives money to the state, SEA yeah. funnels it down to LEAs, yeah. and the state, almost all of them have these constitutional rules. The state does certain things, but local governments are in charge of their schools. Yes. Unless they change that. And but in most states, local not. governments are creatures of the state. Cor correct. So we could imagine an alternate universe where states within five years decide that they're going to take away the district's right to own their schools and the state can do more. Under that, what I said would not be a problem under current conditions okay. it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you want to make any sort of general response to Andy or Jean-Claude or should we just go ahead with questions? Um, I do have a couple points go that ahead. I'd just like to make. I mean, uh, uh, first, I think in turn, appreciated Andy and Jean-Claude's presentations. I found them very helpful. You know, I, th I think the concerns that I have with Andy's analysis are threefold. One is, as I said, stated earlier, it seems like a lot of his data is not really particularly relevant to has the president and the secretaries taking on school turnaround in such aggressive way with such a large amount of resources, um, with such, they have used their bully pulpit, they have used not just the SIG program, but other programs under their jurisdiction as a lever to galvanize a movement around school turnaround of our lowest performing schools. And the, a lot of the data that Andy references has nothing to do with that because it predates our efforts, including the Fordham paper that he referenced. Um, I, th I think, I, I just wanna explain my um, reference to defining failure um, down, uh, Senator Moynihan used this uh, term quite a bit. Um, it, it, it's just... She actually said defining deviancy down, but, but yeah. we'll take sorry, your point. No, All sorry. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the data, I just want to be clear that we, we do not, we have not declared victory based on this first year of data, but it's just perplexing to me that given what we see in that data, that Andy is ready to condemn the program to failure, but yet in response to the Credo study of charter schools in New Jersey, he said it was a slam dunk where we saw relatively similar levels of success and failure. And I don't, I don't say this to say that I think he was wrong about the charter movement in New Jersey. I think that is pro that there is promising results there that we should learn from that gives us um, a basis for continuing to to support the charter school movement, but it just seems like he is defining failure up with respect to turnaround um, and proposing an intervention charters where he's defining failure down in that context. There's, there's, if you dissected charter data as he, he picked a, a district in the country and turnarounds, I could likewise, but would not want to, pick a small data set related to charter schools and, and incomparably pick it apart. It doesn't mean we shouldn't um, delve into these data and see what lessons we can learn from it, but I'm just disturbed at his, his willingness to take one year of data, which he knows is not valid for an evaluation of the program and condemn the program based on it. Um, and I guess the, the third point that disturbs me about his, his analysis is his failure to look at the national, um, the national picture on this. Um, in New Jersey, it sounds like you, you were stymied in your efforts based on state players and state law. So, but, but I, I guess I would urge you to look at other states that, that are taking this on as a statewide systemic initiative and districts like Houston and Denver that are taking this on as a district systemic initiative and see how we can learn to them, learn from them. I do, I do think we believe that the, in terms of um, 
which model to choose or what interventions to put in place. We, we do believe that they have to be robust. I think it's a valid point to ask whether the transformation model is sufficiently robust. But I, you know, and from, from where we sit, we think the jury is still out. We see transformation schools that are doing great things for kids. Um, so, you know, I think Jean Claude's comments about is sustainability is a real issue. I think we agree with that. I also agree with Jean Claude that we need to reform, make district level reforms, mm -hmm. and not just put this on the back of these school individual schools. I I just don't believe that the district wide reform we need is is simply to turn them over to charter management organizations or charters in all instances. But um, we do believe that we need to focus at district and state level reforms, which is something we've done through other levers like ESEA Flex. Uh, are you using a double standard, Andy, uh, no, uh, for uh, comparing no. charter evaluations with uh, uh, federal SIG data? No, 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 no. So um, <laughs> the Credo research was, uh, I believe, five years worth of data, not one year's worth of data. Um, and it showed that Newark wasn't making a little bit of progress. It showed that kids there, I think in math, were learning a full year more in math than um, per year than a student who went to a traditional public school. And this is part of the fabric of um, the Credo set of studies in uh, New Orleans and in New York City and in a couple other places that show when chartering is done right, you can get extraordinary results. So again, context. If chartering is done right, previous studies show great things happen. The Newark study comes out, shows the same thing. I say, wow, that's uh, we're leading to something. 50 years worth of study shows that turnarounds don't work. New data is coming out showing we're spending $5 billion. More than a third of schools are getting worse. The ones that are getting better are getting better by this much. Um, and they're saying that, well, listen, this is the first time we've put money into this. No, Annenberg put tons of money into this. Gates put tons of money into this. States have put tons of money into this. There is nothing new under the sun. We are not the first ones to go about this business. And if you want to show humility, I think the humility is this is part of a long-term history, and these results aren't different from what we've seen in the past. They flow in the exact same direction. Well, allow me to say that you're picking cities that suit your argument, and Carmel is picking cities that suit her <laughs> argument. Uh, she cited Denver and Houston several times. Uh, you cited uh, Newark uh, 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 this time. Uh, we've got a lot of schools in this country and a lot of, and a lot of cities. And I want to go to the two big issues on my, that I want to get the two big things that worry me off my chest and get you to respond, all of you, please. The first goes to the theory of action that the district that allowed these schools to get crummy in the first place is the right agent to change them. Why do we believe that? Uh, and the other is, is anything sustainable uh, in, American, uh, <laughs> in American public <clears throat> education? Jean-Claude alluded to the, um, the backward slippage of uh, Rochester, for example, after he left there. Uh, there's any number uh, of examples of cities where, um, uh, I mean, when uh, Tom Bosberg leaves Denver someday, are the, are the gains that uh, uh, Carmel's been describing there going to be sustained? Um, but for that matter, uh, can a charter school's gains be sustained when the uh, founder leaves and the uh, uh, charter school's five-member governing board, uh, three of whom are related to the founder by blood, uh, replaces the founding principal with somebody else. Is this sustainable? Is anything good sustainable? Uh, especially if it has had to be wrenched from something bad uh, in the first place. So having gotten those two large concerns, is the district theory of action um, uh, plausible? And is anything sustainable? I would love you all three to speak to, to these things because they worry me quite a lot. Sorry if you like. Sure. Um, so I think it's a really good question about whether the district is the right uh, change agent. I think that it's hard to, to, to say from Washington whether, whether a particular district is the right entity to engage and turn around. Um, I think that's one of the reasons we've been very supportive in the context of ESCA Flex of these state states moving towards a model where they're also identifying uh, turnaround districts and taking them on. If you look at the Tennessee flex application, their theory of change, their theory of action is that the state is 
responsible for turning around districts and districts are responsible for turning around schools and if districts show an incapacity to help schools improve that the the, the state should uh, t take in and the take a more aggressive role. The state in effect role. takes the school away from the district. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So I think that that is something that is worth supporting and seeing how that plays out. I think it's very difficult given our system of federalism for us to dictate that from Washington, but I think it is something that we have supported through several of our programs. Um, but then, you know, there's obviously d districts where they, they are the right change agent. agent. New York, uh, Denver, uh, Houston are a few. Um, there's, so I think that, that that's something that we can't say it's an all or nothing answer. In terms of sustainability, I think that is one of the things that worries us most, not just in this space, but in other spaces. I think it's what has driven the Secretary to focus on systemic changes that will create a foundation for reforms to take hold and continue things like having um, a common set of high college and career ready standards, having a human capital system that's an effective human capital system. I think one of the reasons we don't see sustainability in education reform in America to date is because we have been too focused on silver bullet type interventions instead of saying we need to build a system upon which success can be built and retained as the people change. But I do think one of the greatest threats to the turnaround effort but also to education reform in general is this idea of um, a churn in the education system, whether it's at the state superintendent level, the district superintendent level, or the teacher workforce. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> first, first of all, for your first question, I, I really believe that the district can be uh, the agent, but not with, without great support um, um, from the SEA, from the state ag ag agency, in making this happen. Um, it's, when you look at Denver, for instance, as well, um, great things have happened in Denver. You've had two leaders, I think, in, in succession of done terrific work. But within a political context, I was changing in Colorado. So without that, that wouldn't have happened um, um, in Denver. Um, so it's possible, but you need the stars to align. You need a great school board who really understands how to make things happen. Or for that matter, a great governance structure that will allow a good superintendent in, in, in giving up power and giving things away um, um, to schools and really creating a file organization, creating the, the uh, system of accountability and support for schools. A great, so I see two roles for districts. One being a knowledge management organization, mm -hmm. uh, one in being a, the one that creates the, the layer of accountability for things to actually work across a district. The second, in terms of sustainability, there are two things that people don't give up. One is wealth. The second is is, is freedom. Um, if you can find a way to give principals control of their fiscal, or their financial, the three things they, they care most about, time, people, and money, real control, real devolution of power um, to principals, um, and of course, without... You, you need the requisite uh, uh, capacity building. And right now you have a bench problem when it comes to the principalship. If you give them control, I don't care who comes in that seat, the churn that we see in districts or states, if you give them control, these folks will fight to the end to protect their schools and to keep them as, as autonomous as possible. I think that's a great solution to create the sustainability. If you don't do that, you're going to see this revolving door of, of or the same schools that, that come in and out of failure will continue to come in and out of failure over the next 20, 30 years. So you would you would you would vest the sustainability uh, job, so to speak, at the building level. Without question. Huh. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. On the district question, I mean, I mean, I wrote an entire book about this very subject because I feel so passionately about this. I mean, I think it is not a coincidence that we have not had a single high-performing urban district in the past 50 years, even for one year. I mean. At some point, we have to say 5,000 iterations of failures is more than a coincidence. It is a pattern. Um, even when Miami-Dade was uh, given the award this year as like the best urban district under the Broad Prize, I went and looked at NAEP Tudor results, the trial urban district assessment, to say, wow, Miami must be hitting the ball out of the park. Um, I would encourage you guys to take a look at NAEP Tudor results. Um, I think in Miami in eighth grade, uh, in reading and math, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of kids are proficient. Uh, double check me if anyone has a computer. And I also went back and looked at Houston, because Houston won the Broad Prize about a decade ago. Well, maybe they were making progress, and maybe now they're a beacon. I think between 10, 15, 20 percent of their kids are proficient in reading and math. Um, the district is broken. I mean, this is how I begin my book. The traditional urban school system is broken. It cannot be fixed. It must be replaced. The idea that 
the biggest lesson I learned as a state policymaker was that school dysfunction is a function of district dysfunction. Um, these schools, even the best principals, struggle mightily because of district hiring policies, the contracts that are in place, board meddling, and on and on and on. We will never, ever, ever have a city with a um, critical mass of high-performing schools until we get rid of the urban school district. So Andy's actually arguing against a long-standing belief of my own, uh, which is that everybody has the greatest enthusiasm for whichever level of government they've had the least direct experience with. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, so, Jean-Claude, you've run a couple of urban school districts. Are, is this structure fatally flawed, as Andy would have it? The short answer is yes. I mean, school districts or schools, for that matter, were never designed to teach all kids. So we have this fallacy that the current structure is going to do what we think it should be doing. It was never designed to do that. So I don't know if the answer is what Andy is proposing, but certainly what exists right now does not work and will never ever work. When you take a look at, I've worked in multiple sort of governance structures in New York City with a mayor control um, um, urban sort of um, a panel, um, in Rochester with the seven member elected boards along party lines, and then in Chicago with mayor control uh, with an appointed school board. I've seen a different governance structure, some are much easier than others to deal with and navigate, but nonetheless, all three I think are flawed, uh, um, all, all ultimately will not create what we look to create in school systems, which is why I argue so, so strongly We've got to build the capacity at the school level, but create the kinds of, of structure at the district level that will monitor and support. I think you need some oversight. Um, otherwise, you're going to have sort of helter-skelter uh, across systems. But if you really build the capacity and give principals and their teams the autonomy to do what needs to be done with some level of autonomy control and, and, and dissemination of, of, of best practice or effective practices, I think you've got some, some hope for success. Carmel, can we expect the second term to bring any attention to governance reform in American public education? You'll have to stay tuned for our second term agenda discussion. But I do think <coughs> if you look at the SIG program, we, under Arnie's leadership, we're trying to tackle some of the issues that Jean-Claude is, is mentioning. We were limited by the statutory framework that we were given by Congress. But you know, I think the different the reason Andy's wrong in saying we just put money into it and did nothing different, that is just categorically untrue. We did a lot of things different, including saying to states and districts, if you want this funding stream, you have to tackle um, you have to tackle things like every single model requires them to give greater autonomy to the new school. Uh, or the reconceived school around time, people, and money, exactly what, what you all have been saying. So I think there's no disagreement that at, I, I would argue the district level is not greater than other levels of the education system. At the state level, at the district level, at the school level, there's flaws in our current system that don't empower people and provide them with the su systemic supports they need to succeed. Um, I think in the SIG program, it is by far not perfect and needs further improvement. Um, but it, 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 we did think about that and think about how we could provide systemic support for people making governance changes, for people changing staffing in a school. Um, so I think it's, it is a le an experiment in that regard, and you could argue that we didn't go far enough, but it has, it has created tremendous change, not just at the district level, but also at the state level, as I've described, and in thousands of schools across the country. We're going to open this up in just one second, so if you've got a question, uh, get ready. Um, Carmel, what about the financial sustainability? Um, it was alluded to earlier that the SIG money is going to run out and the changes that some of these schools have been working at making, they won't be able to keep making. Yeah, I think that's a really um, critical issue that we need to address. We are fighting for additional resources for these schools through the budget process. Mm -hmm. We also are looking to free up funding at the district level to support these schools through our ESEA Flex Initiative. We think helping a school that's showing success continue on the pathway to success is a better use of that school's funding than private tutoring that has not demonstrated to work. Um, so I think that th we are looking for ways to help districts tackle that very important issue. Um, you know, we, we will need long term. We are the minority investor in this space writ large. So we do need states and districts to partner with us in these efforts. I.e., you'd also like them to bring some of their own money to the table for this. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I believe we've got at least one mic in the room to go around. Um, two. Okay. Uh, so who has a, 
a question. Yes, we'll start with you. I'd, uh, bring her a mic and identify yourself and make sure that it resembles a question. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, I'm Allison Klein from Education Week, um, and my question is for Carmel. Um, Carmel, as you know, the um, Senate um, ESEA renewal bill um, that was approved, like, I guess almost a year ago now, um, included some new models um, for SIG, and also at, through an amendment um, would allow states to um, create their own models and submit them to the department for approval. And I was wondering if that's something that the department um, supports um, and something that you might consider doing um, through a regulation process or support through appropriations, something like that. You're talking about models other than the four that are in the other current the, the in the current program, uh, which let me just remind you are uh, turnaround, replace the principal and at least half the staff, restart, reopen the school under the management of a charter operator or somebody else, school closure, uh, close it and send the kids elsewhere, or what is called transformation. Uh, and in spite of the word, is the is the least invasive of uh, these of these treatments. Replace the principal, introduce significant instructional reforms, et cetera, but doesn't say replace anybody else other than the principal. So we we have let folks in Congress know that we're open to talking about additional models. Um, our challenge back when people talk about adding models is what model would you like to do that you don't have the flexibility to do under the transformation model? Transformation model was designed to tackle uh, the situation that in some places, particularly in rural areas, there are no CMOs. Shutting down the school is not practical because it's the only game in town. Um, so, uh, you know, when people uh, assert that we need more models, our response is, well, tell us what that would look like and why you can't do it under the current construct. And to date, we don't feel like people have come up with a good answer to that question. Um, what our concern here is not that we think the four models that we've laid out are the en are without flaws and, and that there is no possibility that there could be additional models, but what we're worried about is what we saw prior to the SIG program under NCLB where there was an other, a very touchy-feely other, where essentially nothing happened. It was tinkering around the edges. Our models are trying to get at core what research tells us are core issues that need to be tackled in these schools that you need. Um, you need a leader who's who's not just a good leader, but a great leader who, who can tackle this very difficult situation. You need the right staff in the building. You need people to who are willing to build a new culture in that school. You need to tackle the curriculum. You need to tackle instructional sports. You need to, to tackle the time on task. Um, but you, you do really need, it can't, it can't be something that's tinkering, tinkering on the edges. It needs fairly radical change. So our models are designed to get at that. Um, so you know, we, f we feel like to, to add more that would move aw in the opposite direction is not the right thing to do. I mean, right. You did say we could hold you personally responsible <laughs> for the other in NCLB from your days with Senator Kennedy, didn't you? <laughs> I, I said I, I had to take responsibility. <laughs> All right. I mean, that was added, I can tell you, from, from being in the, the heart of that debate, yeah. um, and I was in a position of arguing against it at the time, that it was something that was added um, for political reasons, that there was a sense that, you know, these mo that that it was too drastic. Otherwise, it was too drastic. Yeah, that's what I that's just, what, just go one, ahead, please. So, I'm, first of all, I'm glad there is an other. So, f several years ago, I wrote a white paper given to Senator Harkin, pushing that the phasing phase out model we had in New York City and in Rochester was not sort of uh, clearly uh, supported by the four models. And we thought that would be the best change to our high schools um, in, in, bo in both cities. So I'm glad that there is a, a, another. I don't mind the accountability and, and the oversight. But having a lot of people think through what's possible in school redesign, I think, is much better than boxing people into sort of four. So what um, about the four models didn't work for that model? Well, the phasing phase out was not explicitly allowed. In fact, in New York, we have to use alternate funding um, to, to support those, those kinds of changes. If you look at the, the transformation, the, the restart, et cetera, those, like phasing in a new school, as an old culture disappears over time, would always least disruptive to kids. Well, that's what you mean by phase in, phase, phase out. out. Exactly. It means introduce a new school grade by grade. Grade by grade into in the, the space building of, of an old build, of an old school. Okay. Well, that's okay. going away okay. year okay. by yeah. year as well, too. Was not explicitly allowed in the four models, although we found ways to actually make it happen in New York. 
Can I just say one thing? I yeah. want to agree with Carmel on, on one thing, but then uh, hold up, uh, I think, the bigger issue. So I don't. I wouldn't disagree. I don't think anyone here would disagree that in order for a school to succeed, necessary conditions are a great principal, a great curriculum, the use of data, great teachers, on and on and on. Those conditions are necessary, but they are not sufficient because of the things that the district does to a school that inhibits all of those. Districts are the ones that make rules related to HR, who can get hired when they are hired, when they are brought on board. They are the ones that actually sign the collective bargaining You mean the choice agreement. between the drunk and the incompetent. Yes. <laughs> Precisely. They're the ones who sign the CBA that says um, how long the school day is and how much they get paid and how much the uh, uh, power the principal has over things. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So we're tinkering with these things that sound really good, but within the context of this district structure, uh, I can't tell you how many times, let me just give you one example. There was a district that came to us that wanted SIG, us being New Jersey, um, and they wanted to do the turnaround model, that is moving the principal out. And we said, that's fantastic. They came back two weeks later and said, sorry, we can't do that. Um, we only have one high school in the district. And our rules in the contract and uh, negotiations with the union and district rules say that that principal has to be a principal. Since we only have one high school, we can't get rid of him. We have to keep him somewhere. The only job that he can do is be a high school principal. Therefore, we have to keep him. We can't do this model. We have to do something lesser. The school could have done something bigger, uh, just a great example of district policy getting in the way. And that is going to be. Uh, with all of these things, what ultimately is the is the sounds hurdle. like the intersection of district policy and a collective bargaining agreement. If I'm hearing you correctly, and all those yes. All right. Um, next question. Yes, take this lady the mic. Uh, I'm Laurie Calvert. And I work at the U.S. Department of Education, and Are you I'm part a of the former Carmel teacher. Clock? I I know Carmel. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, Carmel, if you could speak to. You said that last week you had Terry Greer and Don Bosberg and. Ronald Fryer in talking about SIG and their experience with what's working and what's not working. Were there any things from that two-hour session that really stuck out to you as something that you've learned? Yeah, we, we need to do more of this and we need to rethink that. Well, I think it, it validates some of the things that Andy and Jean-Claude are saying. I mean, I think what they're doing there is looking at some of these district-level policies that are inhibiting success at the school level which are, are, you know, they are requirements of the SIG program that, that these schools be given autonomy with respect to time, people, and budget. So um, it looks like they're carrying that out, and other districts may not be doing it as well, but I think we can really learn from their example. They're also embracing charter schools in both contexts. There's, there's not a belligerence towards it. They're using that as part of their plan for re, um, responding to the fact that they have so many low-performing schools. Um, and I think that's a good thing, that it's not an either or, it's both, because we need both, because there's such <coughs> tremendous pressure happening there. Um, and, you know, they have echoed what we have heard across the country, which validates what Arnie had, saw firsthand in Chicago, is that you really, talent matters, uh, culture matters, and those are hard things for us to dictate at the federal level, but, um, you know, things that have to change if, if these schools are going to be successful in the long term. Thank you. Uh, over there, behind the pillar. Carmel, you addressed a little bit of that when you talked about the uh, flack you originally got. You, you described it from the left with regard to ending poverty before you could fix the schools. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. We're, we're sort of focused on governance and the people in the building, which we think are critical ingredients. I agree with Andy. If you don't, if you don't change that, you're not going to radically change the school. But I, but I do. And changing it might be to create the culture among the staff that are there. That's the theory behind the transformation model. Um, but but all of you know 
all of our turnaround strategies also incorporate this idea that there would be additional resources for the school to tackle um, things like wraparound supports for students, extending learning time. We do see that the schools that extend learning time provide more time on task, but also provide more time for enrichment for these students can make a huge difference. So I do think that those are sets of issues that you have to tackle in the turnaround context. Um, but again, it's not a reason that we can't do better. We have seen where there are high, you know, very high populations, almost 100% of populations of, of high poverty students with, with good leadership, strong supports, um, high quality teachers, uh, highly effective teachers that those students can be successful. So we just need to be careful not to write off the school because of the population that's being served. Jean-Claude? just want to add to that. So, it, so yes, so the, the, the answer is yes to everything you've said. Um, it goes back to my, to my push that in many of these failing schools, you'll find a high concentration of kids who are very needy, who, where the school is everything to those, to those children. There's no support at all outside of the school structure. But you will also find in many cities, I can talk from my personal experience, that you know the teachers who are not the greatest tend to gravitate to those, those places. So you get a critical mass of ineffective people principals who don't know how to select teachers, who don't know how to develop them, where people are coming in basically to hide into to wait out their retirement. So you have this sort of confluence of issues all coming together all at once, and then you, you may have a great leader come in, and that person now is fighting the CBA, fighting the district to begin to change people. In one instance, one person I had, a guidance counselor, 60 grievances in a year. I spent my time living at central office defending the termination. By the time I was done, over three years, this person retired a few months before I finished uh. and was gone. Um, so because it took that long to remove someone who was, was tenured. So what I'm saying very simply is that it's not just the school or the kids, it's district, it's state laws that, that get in the way. So it, it's, it's, it's massive, and which is why I say complex issues require comprehensive solutions. Let me just say, in, the, I, in each of the three sectors, you are going to find high-performing, high-poverty schools. And I actually do this in multiple cities in my book, in chapters 3, 6, and 9, I think, showing that in every single one of these cities, you are going to find high-performing traditional public schools that are serving 80, 90 percent kids in poverty. Same thing with charters, same thing with private schools. They are too few. Um, but they exist, so it belies this argument that, you know, until we solve poverty, um, we're not going to be able to solve school performance. There are great schools that are doing it every day. We just don't have enough of them. Uh, and incidentally, one of the interesting things about his book is that he debunks the notion that all charters are successful or that all private schools are successful. Correct. Uh, no panacea is here. He's That's got right. plenty of data on all three sectors, both uh, both on the upside and on the downside. I was going to add a uh, brief Fordham commercial, but it speaks to a, to a uh, problem area that nobody's mentioned, which is the kids who aren't there in the school, the turnover issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Ford, the Ohio branch of Fordham has just brought out a stunningly complicated and elaborate set of data on uh, student mobility in Ohio mm -hmm. from school to school and district to district. Uh, and a lot of the troubled schools are struggling with immense rates of student mobility in the course of a year uh, and, and vastly more so over the course of, of, of a couple of years. Uh, and uh, this is obviously hard to turn around a school when you're measuring it by student performance <laughs> if the students uh, aren't staying put. Uh, in your school, you can have a wonderful um, intervention, but um, the kids aren't there long enough for it to actually take, have much effect. Uh, so check out our website if you're interested in the Ohio. We think the Ohio study ought to be a model for a kind of mobility study that other places ought to also do, get these data for themselves. This is right down to the building level for every public school in Ohio and charter. Uh, bring the mic up here. Susan Sclafani uh, raised her hand. Um, subtly but the, uh, <laughs> unmistakably and she has experience in Houston as well I as the indeed. US Department uh, of Education yes and based on that I agree that the district can either be a force for good or a, a debilitating factor in the success of schools and certainly the the devolution of power is something Jean-Claude mentioned that's essential to schools that are able to use that power well and put all your support against the ones who, uh, who can't do it themselves. But I have another question for all three of you, which is we have a tsunami coming when the new Common Core assessments come out and show that every school is failing. And the school improvement grants are not going to be enough to, to try and get there. So how do you work on the issue of real evidence of learning versus graduation rates that can be 
doctored through uh, the, uh, the computerized course catch-up programs that don't teach students anything other than hitting the keys repeatedly, <laughs> and easy skills-based tests that are currently in our states that people are using as evidence against real evidence of deep learning that's going to be required in the next round. And what do you do about teachers who are totally unprepared to teach at the level, have never themselves learned at the level that you're now going to ask them to teach at? I suspect we're going to have many more sessions on the challenges of Common Core implementation around the country over the next uh, three, four, five years. Uh, and uh, I doubt we will do justice to that topic here today. Um, I think it is clearly true, as, 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 as you just said, Susan, that an enormously larger number of schools than we've ever seen before uh, are going to look to be in need of improvement as a consequence of higher standards and new, and new assessments. And what to do about them is a fair question. Um, an area where I know the feds have to tread delicately um, with this state-based initiative, but I'd welcome everybody's uh, at least quick reflections on this on this challenge. Let me just uh, start by saying, uh, a common core, bravo, bravo. I, I really feel it's going to, if it's done well, will be a transformative sort of uh, um, a piece for our school systems. Let me give you one nugget of challenge. In Chicago, we pushed through a fuller school day, longer school day initiative. Frankly, we're benchmarking to the rest of the country, not really adding that much more time. Um, but at the same time, I had parents who were fighting very hard against more time in school. One group in, in, the, in the very far south side, middle class community, uh, mostly Caucasian community, my office arguing against more time. And when I pushed a piece of paper to them and showed them their, their data, um, they were 82, 85% proficiency. And I said, once we move to park and, and, and come in court, you're going to drop to 28%. Do you need more time? I mean, you saw a bit of reflection, but they went right back to fighting against more time. So th th there is a changing of, of, or perhaps a push to change the perception that every school is doing well. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to see sort of relative performances. Some will drop to 28, some will drop to 2. And you're still going to see people sort of fall back to what they think is good. So I think we have to keep talking about what high quality means and what we're benchmarking to and to change people's perception about what is and what is not working across our schools, whether it be middle class or very poor or high performing or very low performing. So it's a conversation piece for our schools over the next, um, um, I guess, few years. Uh, I guess what I would say is that um, it is far easier to say Common Core implementation than to do Common Core implementation. <laughs> Um, and I, and I think a lot of policymakers got ahead of ourselves on this. And states are really accustomed to doing new standards alignments. This is something they go through all the time when it comes to various subjects. Uh, that means there is an inertia. They're used to doing this. And then they tinker with their tests and they tinker with um, uh, professional development and so forth. If this is going to be completely different as Common Core advocates believe it is going to be, it's going to have to be wholly different on all those different levels. And I don't think states are really prepared for that. So I'm put me in that hand, the camp of the hand ringers when it comes to Common Core implementation and state assessments and setting cut scores. Um, it is wonderful to say we are going to benchmark with the greatest countries in the world. Um, the implementation, all this stuff after that is the gory stuff that uh, I'm concerned about. I agree that adopting standards is the easy part, and the hard part is translating that into effective instruction. Um, again, it's an area where I'm going to take the optimistic view instead of the pessimistic <laughs> view. Uh, through our ESCA Flex Initiative, we have over 30 states, and we're likely to have as many as 40 very soon that are uh, laying out fairly detailed plans in terms of how they're going to translate standards to practice. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have um, obstacles along the way. In including resource obstacles. It, it will take money to make these assessments operable in schools. It will take money to provide teachers with the professional development they need to teach to the new standards, to revamp teacher prep programs so they're also designed to uh, produce people prepared to teach to the new standards. I guess one of the obstacles that I'm most worried about is uh, relates to your point, Susan, about when the data comes out and shows that everybody's failing. Um, I think it, it will require a tremendous amount of political courage to say, yes, we, we are failing, but at least now we know the truth, and now we need to do the hard work of getting better. So I think that that's something that um, the Secretary talks about a lot, and he's hopeful that um, you know, he can help in that regard by giving political leaders the, the, the cover to, keep, to 
adopt the higher standards and take the blows from the lower results. But he's also just really optimistic because he sees state leadership and district leadership across the country where uh, folks seem willing and ready to do this as well. He's also learned to his, uh, uh, through his pains that uh, uh, backing the Common Core too strongly can backfire in some places, um, just politically, um, where in states where it's already controversial. Um, but uh, it's, so it's, a, it's a, a sticky situation to be in. In any case, your flex initiatives can only deal with the federal share, right? I mean, this is the ESEA flex can deal with, e, deals with ESEA dollars, right? Well, it asks the state to develop a plan for how they're going to translate standards to practice, and, yeah. and they can and are using state and district resources to do that, not just ESCA dollars. Okay, so, so they're leveraging some of their own money uh, yes. uh, in yeah. this way as well. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Uh, back row. Hi, I'm Jeremy Ayers from the Center for American Progress. I just wanted to, to point out, and I do have a question, is that it's an interesting thing that no one discussed very much, is that the department, the, um, the, the new administration made a shift in the, the, the money going from the state to the district no longer being formula but being competitive. And Andy, you alluded to this, right, when you all sort of finally got serious or got more serious about the competitive process to use that to reward the districts they wanted to make the changes you wanted. We did a piece where we found some states did that, some states like Vermont just wanted to give it to everyone sort of from that old mindset of we want to get the money to everyone. So my question is, can we use the competitive process to drive some of this change that we're talking about? And do we also have to be then more realistic that we're not going to get widespread change? We're going to sort of focus it on those places that are willing to make change. So does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think we, we start with Carmel. I mean, the ups and downs of the competitive process. Yeah, I think, that, Jeremy, I should have mentioned that. I mean, in, in response to Andy's comments about the federal government saying that we can't dictate which which models the district chooses and the state can't necessarily dictate it. The the reason that we chose to make that pivot from formula to competitive is to try to provide a, a lever for states to pick the districts that were willing to tackle collective bargaining agreements if that was the obstacle to change, tackle district policies, tackle district leadership if that was the problem to change that needed changing. So that was definitely our intent in moving towards the competitive process. We think there's been mixed results, as you've mentioned, in terms of states um, taking advantage of that lever. But, we, but um, you know, I think we see a tremendous amount of um, positive movement in that result. And again, it's just the reason that I think it's just wrong to use 30 years of data that didn't have that kind of momentum uh, of a, a national movement with dollars behind it, with new lever levers at the state and district level to, to create real change, to condemn the program. We might need to condemn it in a few years after we see the, the, the data, but uh, we think that there's lots of reasons why this is different, and it's different not just because we changed SIG to a competitive program, but because we supported SIG with other programs and policies to help give state and district leaders room to do the right thing in this space. Okay, competitive grants. So I think Arne Duncan is already, even just in his first term, going to go down as the, the most important influential U.S. Secretary of Education for a lot of reasons, um, mostly because, though, of the competitive grant movement. Um, I think it's brilliant, and it has led to lots of good stuff, but there are limits to it. Um, we're starting to see some of that, I think, with Race to the Top District that we can talk about later on, but especially with this. Um, there was a limitation to it. So yes, we have the right to do competitive grants to districts with SIG We, when I was at the state. But if all of the districts apply to do the transformation model, uh, what are you really competing over? You're, you're cho choosing among a bunch of um, not so great options. Um, the other thing is a lot of these districts don't have the capacity to do the things that they claim they're going to do. Um, they have these great plans and then we realize, um, but hey, you had to return $100 million in federal funds last year because you couldn't keep your books straight. Do you really think you can turn around seven schools using this new model? Um, and the last thing I guess I'll say about this is, uh, uh, um, I'll just leave it there. Some districts, I assume, are too, uh, too brain dead or leaderless to even apply in a competitive grant situation. Well, so that's what's going to say. The truth of the matter is big urban districts have a whole lot of staff and a whole yeah. lot of people they can put towards writing grants. Um, just because you get a great grant application from a big district, that means they may have raised private money or had staff working on it. And a small district might not have any staff, and they might have the ability um, to do this. And that's something that we always wrestled with, and it's hard to put it, your finger on. 
I, I don't know, the U.S. Department of Education proved last week that a large urban district that raises private money and hires expert grant writers doesn't always get the grant, uh, as when Cleveland did not get its, uh, its, uh, its, its district uh, uh, race to the top grant, though they had done all those things. Uh, Jean-Claude? Sure. So um, let me just say that most of my colleagues disagree with what I'm going to say. Um, I like the competitive grant uh, uh, push. It forces districts to be much more comprehensive, coherent uh, in terms of the application. Um, and at the same time, if they don't get the money and they're still interested in doing reform, it forces people to look internally to see what they have available to them to do what needs to be done. So a lot of what we, we do doesn't always require dollars to make it happen. It's number one. Um, number two, um, you know, it, 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 when you go back to sustainability, you know, the money should be used as a catalyst to get things to happen. Too often, it does not happen. You sort of lean and use it as a crutch to continue or perpetuate what you need to, to make happen. So I'm going to argue again that competition is great. It forces us to rethink and to be much more agile in what we do. Um, and, and second, you know, it, it forces those who don't get the money to look internally to make, things, to make things happen. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm, I also welcome the push toward providing districts with the push to apply directly without going to the SEA. Very often we have much more capacity than the state education division to make that happen. We made this argument to Arnie uh, uh, Duncan uh, about a year ago that you know, when you look at New York, Chicago, and LA, we have more kids than most states in America. Um, so three of us can be much more agile and innovative than the SEAs can be. So I welcome the push to allow districts to apply and the competition as well. So this is as good a panel as we've had in a long time here, and it's going to be on the uh, website uh, uh, within 24 hours. So please encourage your uh, your friends and colleagues to uh, watch it for themselves uh, when they when convenient. And in the meantime, why don't you join me in thanking this trio? Thank you.